<clears throat> okay, so we have um, we have something to resolve regarding due dates. Um, what are the current outstanding assignments? Five and six. Five so, was due last night at midnight. And when was six due? Friday. 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 This Friday. All right, so there have been a lot of issues with Jaguar that the uh, system administrator is currently working on, or it seems like it's more network trouble than Jaguar trouble, but trouble nonetheless. Um, so I need to push back reopen 5. <clears throat> um, and 6 was due Friday? All right, so I may very well continue on with another assignment or start a new project or something like that, but uh, I will push the due dates for both of those to, oh, I'm thinking uh, like Tuesday at midnight maybe. <clears throat> That'll give you the weekend and one more lab. I don't think I have any specific activities planned for the labs early next week. Um, so we'll do that. So after class, I'll, I'll push that due date back. So uh, assignment five should reopen, and then you'll have more time in assignment six. Again, with the caveat that don't wait to the last minute because I will be moving forward. Yes? Does this mean you want us to resubmit it? If you've already submitted it and you're happy with it, then, then you're great. So nothing's going to disappear. It's just going to allow people to click the button who didn't. So, so we can resubmit if we want to fine tune. So if you want to fine tune and resubmit, that's fine. All right. Yes. Is the quiz going to be pushed back? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I guess I probably better do that as well. Yes. So I'll push back the quizzes as well. All right. Any other administrative questions then? Are you, are you really going to keep the new format for the assignments? Because it's kind of annoying. Oh, is it annoying? Why is it annoying? Because I liked it when you could see everything on the same page and then just move to another page for the tech quiz, but now you have to switch between like three different pages to find everything for the assignment. Is that the consensus? Yeah. Yep. How many how many people prefer the new format? How many people prefer the original format? Wow, I'm surprised. Okay. Uh, I will I'll I'll continue to yeah, so I'll see if I can come up with I, I'm not happy until I get no hands at all. Um, for no one wanting anything. Uh, so I'll see if I can make the format yet more turgid for this third round. Um, <clears throat> the thing I don't, didn't like about the original format was that, every, it, that it was harder to find everything. Like there's some people that weren't even aware their quizzes because they're buried in that folder. So I may pull things out of the folder. Mm, I don't know. I'll figure out something, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and not use the uh, current format moving forward. All right. So, how about any questions on anything at all, including stuff that maybe Andreas covered? Anyone ha have any general questions they want to ask about that? Yes? Uh, between files? Yeah, so if I grab All right, so 
So the situation is I have two files. I have my application in code.cpp. Whoops. And then I also have a function that I need in stuff. So an example of this was I provided a main for A6. And what is uh, what are some ways of getting stuff over? <coughs> so let me let me talk about a non-editor version first. I think the editor version is better to know because a lot of times you need fairly nuanced ways of copying between files. But let me go for the just the the copy one whole file over to another. Uh, so let's say for the sake of argument, everything in stuff.cpp, I would like to go at the end of code.cpp. Uh, there's a function called cat, which we did on one of those first assignments, which all it does is it spits the contents of a file out to the screen, okay? which seems like not a terribly useful function. Um, we saw that the greater than sign is able to redirect the output so that it doesn't go to the screen, but instead it goes to a file. So that would instead put all of the content of stuff.cpp. This, this cat command means concatenate. It would concatenate stuff.cpp to this fdsafd. And I can bring that up in an editor and confirm that, yes, indeed, there's the contents of stuff. Okay, So that's one way of redirecting it to a file. Uh, the thing about this, though, is that it is destructive. So if this is my precious stuff here in FDSAFD, and I do this command, then what this redirection does before it starts taking the contents of the concatenate command and putting it into FDSAFD, the first thing it does is that it zeroes out the contents. So when I do that and I come back and look, my precious stuff is all gone and is replaced with this clap trap right here, which is another way of referring to C++ code, by the way. Uh, but there's a, a real nice variant, which is to have two greater than signs. Now, I don't want you to get confused and you think about CN, the chevrons, and what you're seeing here. Because what we're dealing with here is a technology that is related to the shell, this thing that's providing this prompt. And there's a lot of stuff to it. And I'm just showing you uh, it in bits and pieces because it's not the focus of this course. So this really doesn't mean the chevrons that you mean in CN. This means something completely different for this shell running. And what it means is take the output from this command, which again is spitting it to the screen, and instead concatenate it or append it to the end of this file. So having two of them then is non-destructive, and it just tacks it onto the end. And having done that twice now, I did it up here, and then I have done it again, this time appending. I should see two copies of the claptrap, and sure enough, there's two copies of the claptrap. Uh, so, getting back to my original desire, I wanted to append all of the stuff.cpp contents to the end of code.cpp. So I just say cat stuff.cpp append to the end of code.cpp. Double check it before you hit return because if you did that, then you're going to lose everything that was in code.cpp prior, which is probably not what you want. So I do that. I look at code.cpp. There's my original code.cpp, and then here is what is in uh, stuff.cpp appended to the end. So that's one easy way from the shell of getting the contents of one file to the end of another. <clears throat> more frequently, you want something more nuanced, and I suppose you could then go in here and just delete out the stuff you don't want. So maybe I didn't want this FDSA function at the end, and I didn't want this include in using namespace stuff. And so this is ultimately what I wanted. Uh, a more nuanced way would then to be just to do it from directly within the Vim editor, which has similar abilities to copy and paste between files. So let me return code.cpp to its original form. 
I do that to bring it up in an editor, and then I believe I talked about some of this last time. <clears throat> I can say colon E space. That means I want to edit another file. Give the name of the file you want to edit. And here it is. Now, <clears throat> that allows me to look at more than one file. I can keep doing that all day, bringing up new files. It's <coughs> excitement fades after some time. But a nice shortcut is if I want to go back to code.cpp, I can do that. And if I want to go back to stuff.cpp, I can do that. Uh, but there's a shorthand, which is, does anyone recall? No, oh, too late, I told you. There you go. You do the pound sign, and that means go back to the file you were just editing just now. So I was editing code.cpp. So now what was the file I was just editing just now? It was stuff.cpp. So I can just do colon e pound to toggle between these two files. So that's a nice shortcut. When you're, when you're editing, it isn't uncommon to have two files you want to go between. Uh, so using the, those, now we can get to the final steps, which is actually copying or deleting stuff. So if I want to make a copy of lines 4 through 8, all I have to do is colon 4 comma 8 and the vim nomenclature for copy is yank. That's why it's a Y. So we're going to yank lines 4 through 8. If I wanted to cut them, the equivalent would be D for delete. I'm not going to change this file by deleting them. I'm just going to yank copy. It should tell me that it yanked five lines into what's called the unnamed buffer or in more common nomenclature, the clipboard, if you will, the Vim clipboard, if there is such a thing. Now I go back to the previous file I was editing and then to get the contents of the unnamed buffer I just type P for put. So I decide where in here I want it. Maybe I want it around uh, line 3. So I'll go up to line 2 because when I do put it's going to put it below my current line. Or I could do it here then it would give me a blank line and put it just above the int main. I'll do that. So P for put. And then lines Coincidentally enough, there are lines 4 through 8 here. That's coincidence, of course. Uh, but there it is. <clears throat> yes? When you exit out of Vim, you use semicolon Q, but you've also used semicolon WQ. What's the difference? Uh, so uh, the difference between the W and the WQ is uh, nothing. I'm just able to combine the commands. It's very common. Uh, to write out the file is W, very common command. A uh, very common command is to quit out of the file, colon Q. Uh, you almost invariably, not always, but you almost invariably want to have been editing. And when you're done editing, you want to quit out of the editor, but first you want to save your changes. So it's just saving a few keystrokes. So rather than me doing colon W, return, colon Q, return, I just do colon WQ. It'll write out the file, then quit. Um, <clears throat> And if I just do colon Q without the colon W, of course, it'll complain, saying that I didn't write out my changes. Uh, add, if you're wondering what this is, add exclamation point to override, add bang to override. I can say colon Q exclamation point, and what that'll do is that'll quit without saving changes. So that's kind of an abort mission there. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, the, I can the equivalent of the right quit command is to do two uppercase Z's. So some people actually prefer that. I never did learn it, so it's not in my muscle memory, so I don't do it very frequently. But if I hold down the shift key, I can just type ZZ, and that's the equivalent of writing and quitting out. So some of you may prefer that over colon WQ. Any other, since we're on the subject of Vim, any other editor questions? Everyone's happy with your performance on the editor? I'll give a couple that I, I've, I've mentioned them before, but I just want to mention them again because I, today I saw a few people still do, playing the H and L dance. If you want to get to the end of the file, it's dollar sign. If you want to get to the beginning of the file, it's zero. Or not line, line, not file, excuse me. Say that again. Zero is jump to beginning of line. Dollar sign is jump to end of line. <clears throat> I 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so, okay, I'll, I'll mention searching and replacing. Right. So when you have that end of line, so if I want to add text after this closing parenthesis, I is going to put it between the F and the closing parenthesis. It, the letter you want is A for append. If I do an A, the A will start at the character after the one you're on. Undo is U, lowercase u, okay. and that should be uh, hierarchical, so you should be able to undo all the way back to your original state of the file. I have to break out of the habit of hitting Control Z because I keep getting that, hitting that, and it takes me back to the shell, the terminal shell. Oh yeah, that that's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. If I do a Control Z, you'll actually find that some <coughs> of the uh, the more senior level programmers around here who are kind of in the know actually will do control Z for a mount in an editor like Vim. And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. So note that what it does is uh, it says stop. So actually my editor session is still running. There's a little command you can type called PS for processes. It tells me what processes I'm running. I'm running bash, which is this thing. This is the bash shell running, the thing that's giving me the prompt and taking my input and doing stuff. And then you'll note that when I hit control Z, it did not actually kill my uh, Vim process. It just stopped it. So it's actually still there, ready for me to grab a hold of it again. And the key thing to note is this number here. This is referred to as a job number. So you can get uh, a bunch of jobs going at once. If I was really, really fast, I could, like on the ls command, I can do control Z and it would actually stop the ls command in the middle of doing a directory listing. Um, but I'm not that fast. Uh, <laughs> there are a number of commands where you can, uh, that take some time to run or like Vim or interactive. And if you do control Z, control Z is a generic key set of keystrokes to stop a process in its tracks. To bring that process back up, you type F, and this is, is now stopped in the background. Uh, the abbreviation is FG, that means foreground. What I want to do is I want to bring in the foreground job one, and voila. It start, let me do that again since nothing up my sleeves. I can type jobs. It'll tell me everything I've got going. All I've got is job one that stopped. I can bring into the foreground, front and center, job number one. As soon as I hit return, it restarts Vim exactly where I left off. Okay. Uh, some people like to do that over quitting out of Vim and going back in. Again, that's another thing that I never um, got accustomed to, but I do see a lot of the juniors and seniors doing that. Uh, so let me see. Oh, the <clears throat> regarding movement commands, I did. I may have mentioned this at one point. I'm not sure. Uh, the T letter and F letter, letter referring to any character on the keyboard, essentially. So if I do an F E, that's going to take me forward on top of the next letter E it sees on line 16. So F, and you can see it actually puts a little F there, showing me that I'm in the middle of this command. E. It jumped me on top of that E. Uh, let me show you the difference. TE takes me up to, but not on top of that letter E. Very subtle difference. Kind of the similarity, similarity between insert and append as far as where it leaves you, either before or after the character, essentially. Why is this useful? Because the many, many, nearly all the commands in Vim follow the pattern of movement, or excuse me, of number, movement, 
number command. <coughs> so I can combine these. Uh, I don't necessarily have to do all of them. So for instance, number movement. I know that T E is going to take me up to that letter E, but what if I do 3T? And you can see them down here. 3T, now it's just waiting for a letter E. It'll jump me to the third letter E that it sees on the line. Okay, so there I'm combining a number with the movement. Um, I can't do, some of them don't work. So 3T, 3E is going to move 3T to the, it would basically, if I type 3T, 3E, it would basically start executing after the second 3 because it would mean I want to jump to the third let number 3. Uh, but where you can combine some of these is with um, D for delete or C for change. I think um, so C for change, D for delete. <coughs> now I can say delete. So what I can do is combine. Let me do this. A movement would be, uh, excuse me, I got this backward. My apologies for those who write their notes in ink. No, hang on. Let me think. Let me think. Yes. Sorry, command movement, not movement command. Uh, so I can, for instance, using this template, I can say change to the letter E. Now let me use F instead of T. Change forward on top of the letter E. So if I do that, let me choose, start right here. So if I do change forward, and if I'm going to type a letter E, that means it's going to change from my current location up to and including this letter E right here. So let's see if that's true. I should see TTER, and there it is, and you'll note that I'm in insert mode. Escape, undo. Uh, can we put a number there? Yes, absolutely. We can say change to the second forward E command. Basically, so that this, this whole phrasing refers to uh, the number affecting movement, and this phrasing means a number affecting the command. So if I want to do that, let me choose somewhere in the middle of the line. If I say change to forward E, that's not going to change forward to this first E, but it's going to change forward to the second E. So I should only have the R and the greater than left. And so I do, and I'm in insert mode. Okay. Uh, delete is just like change, except C leaves you in insert mode for you to actually change it. Delete actually leaves you in command mode and just removes the characters. And so. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to experiment with, but you could, of course, do something like that with the two here, with or without the two. Uh, that's, this works just fine. It's just consistency in how all this is structured. I've never done it this way. I think the way I normally do it is like this. So I want to say, okay, I want to change up to the letter E, but I need the second E, so I end up typing a two in the beginning, to change FE, to change up to the second FE, to change FE. And I get the same effect. Okay. Oops. So all the all the combinations work for keystrokes. Um, yes. How did you undo? U for undo. U for undo. Let's redo. Control R. U is undo. Control. Hold down the control key. Hit the R. That's redo. Uh, change, change what? Like how do you uh, create a line from the cursor to the right? Oh, so I want to change from this point to the end of the line? 
Okay, all I have to do is combine a command with a movement. So you've given me the command, which is C for change, right? What movement takes me to the end of the line? Dollar sign. Dollar sign. So C dollar sign does it. So all those movements that are moving your cursor work with these commands. What takes you to the end of the file? Uh, GG takes you to the beginning of the file, and uppercase G takes you to the bottom. So if I do D uppercase G, I delete from that point to the end of the file. All right? And then, then there are the, the oddball commands like DD for deleted an entire line. Uh, also, another thing that I see a lot of is if I... If I've misspelled forward here and I need to change that X to a W, uh, I see variants of it. Some people go right here, they go into insert mode, they hit the backspace, then a W. I see it that way. Uh, some people come here and then they type, uh, they're aware of the X for deleting a character, so they type an X and then they go into insert mode and they type in the replacement. Um, the, the command that you all are looking for is, where do I want to put it, R for replace a single character. So now if I want to replace that X with a W, give me as few keystrokes as possible to do that. I want to replace the X and forward with the letter W. How many keystrokes is it going to take me? Four keystrokes. How do I get to the X? FX, not TX, because TX is going to put me on the R. I want FX to be on top of it. So one, two, FX. Now how do I replace that character? RW. There you go. Four keystrokes, right? Remember, I said if it's taking you more than three keystrokes, then you're probably doing it wrong. All right, so maybe it's four. Uh, but generally, very, very few keystrokes. As soon as you hit L three times to get somewhere, find a different way of doing it. All right. Uh, the last one, which I've mentioned in the past, but I think you all will, it might stick in your heads better, is to move. This is a movement command, so let me put this up here. This is move forward a small word, and this is move forward a large Uh, this would uh, what's the difference between small and large word? The, the small word will pause at the borderline between punctuation and characters and digits. So, for instance, if I have... Um, uh, if I have, if I, if I'm writing a function and I say this function returns a float, it's called Bobby, and it's taking an integer x and a float y for arguments. Okay. If I now watch as I do small w w, that's a small word uh, because there's no. Um, so I should say punctuation or white space for a small word. I do a w again. It pauses as soon as it finds punctuation, which in this case would be the open parenthesis. I do W again, that's where the punctuation ends. I do W again, W, 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 W. So you see how it's pausing at every uh, punctuation type character. A lot of times when you're dealing with code, what I want to do is I just want to sweep by all the white space separated words. So uppercase W, uppercase W, you can see how it's just moving forward to the next white space separated word. Okay, and that'll go on multiple lines. So that'll keep doing it as long as I tell it to. That, and then the to go backward is move backward, a small word. All right, so what I want to do is I've copied and pasted. Here's what, let me start from the beginning. Let's see how few keystrokes I can do to do the uppercase B, which is to move backward a large white space separated word. 
First of all, I want to take advantage. Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste. So how do I copy and paste a line? How do you copy a line? You, you yank a line with YY, -Y, then P for put. Now I need to change that to an uppercase B. I'll give you one more trick. The, the, given what I've told you today, you could type R uppercase B and do it in two keystrokes. There is a keystroke that toggles the case of a letter and that is tilde, toggle the case of a letter. So if I'm here and I do the tilde, that changes to an uppercase B. If I go back to it and I do a tilde again, it goes back to lowercase. So that's what tilde does, is it changes the case of the letter. Um, now I want to change the second half of the sentence to be lar a large white space separated word. So what I want to do is quickly get to the small letter A. Well, this, this is how I would mentally do it. I want to replace the second half of this sentence, but I want to do it with copying and pasting because it's a big hassle to retype it. Uh, first, how do I get to the second half of the sentence? Uh, you could say that, well, it starts at the A, uh, but when I quickly look, I go, you know, I can't tell in half a second how many letters A there are, so I could count all the letters A and go, there's one, two, that's the third letter A, three F A, right? No, you look for something easier to go to that's nearby. That double quote, there are hardly any of those in the line, so why don't I just say F double quote, whoops, F double quote, right? So that's what's happening in my brain to move fast. I, I use the T and the F a lot, but I look for something that's not common to get me there quickly. Once I'm there, uh, how do I delete to the end of the line? Uh, based on what I've talked about today, I would use D dollar sign. So I'm here. D dollar sign is going to delete from my current point to the end of the line. There is a shortcut. D, so where do I have the movement? Do I have the movement for dollar? Yeah, there's the dollar sign. So combining them. I could say D dollar sign delete from current location to end of line. Again, that's a command movement combination. Uh, it turns out that uppercase D, same thing. So let me get to where I was. So it's here. I do an uppercase D because I don't want any of that. Wrong one. Wrong one. So I type U for undo. I say something smarmy like I meant to do that so that I could show off more of the editor. I do a J, another uppercase D. Now I need to go up a couple lines. I'll go ahead and, and sweat a little and actually do K, K, right? No magic to be done there. Not over far enough, so I'll do an H to move one to the left. Now, um, now I need to copy from my current location to the end of the line. So I'll do Y dollar sign. That yanks from my current location to the end of the line. Now I do J, J. I'll do an L and then a P. Okay. So that's my goal for you is that you slowly over the weeks you begin learning these keystrokes and you try and, and every time it's always to move slow so you have to look at your piece of paper to remember the command and so forth but after you do it for two programs and you've got a couple more commands in muscle memory and then a couple more then a couple more that's the idea to get you to the end of the semester where you, you're pretty comfortable with a whole bunch of this stuff it literally you will get really fast by the end of the semester to feel like you're a, a Vim sensei is going to literally take years. And the, reason, and the reason is because you do get fast and you get comfortable and you're no longer itching for that, that weird esoteric command. So you've learned several of them and you're pretty quick and you're quicker than that guy next to you using the mouse and so forth, right? But then what happens is you decide to take an hour out of your day to go to a, a Vim tutorial or the, look at the man page or something and try and find some command you hadn't used before or you see a friend of yours use a command you haven't used before. And so it's yet one more thing that gets under your belt. So it does take years generally, unless you're going to spend eight hours a day studying Vim, which I wouldn't recommend. It will take you years to gradually learn all the different commands.
And I'll admit, there are actually a few that I don't know that I've seen within the last, say, six months. I saw someone using, saw a student do something. How did you do that? Said, oh, this. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. So there we go. <clears throat> um, all right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of this stuff and I'm going to put it in a different file since it's right now in code.cpp. So how am I going to do that? Let's talk about how I'm going to do that. What I'm going to do is I want to, it ends in line 36, starts on line, say, 15. So I'm going to say line 15 through 36. There's an abbreviation here. Dollar sign means the end of the file in this case, but I'll say 36. Okay, write vim commands dot text lines 15 through 36. Hit return, and it's created a new file with 22 lines and 678 characters. Now I've done that. I can delete this stuff. I say D uppercase G to delete all that to the end of the file. I write out my changes, and now I'm back where I was 15 minutes ago. And there's all the commands, which will be posted. All right. Um, yes? You brought up um, directories before in a graphical sense from the editor or the command line. How did you do that? Um, it, I'm sorry. Say it again. When I'm inside of Vim, well, I'm you, doing No, not in Vim. When you're in the command line, you brought up directories, uh, folders from the computer before. Uh, in graphical. In graphical. Yeah. Uh, you mean Instead like. Instead of going in to your start menu and double clicking on a folder, you just brought it up from the command line. Oh, oh, oh! You're saying uh, programs and so forth. Yes. Yes. So this is a, that's a, a quirkiness with the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, yeah, it depends. To run a program in Unix, I just type the name of that program, right? So in Unix, there's something called Firefox, which is the web browser. And, and on Linux, I can just type Firefox, and it'll go find it and run it, all right? It should. Um, but I'm not on Unix right now. Uh, it actually works. Because like earlier today, in the lab, the computer's not working. Stuff. I really wished I had been able to just start running from the fan line. I just know. All right, so if I bring up this virtual machine here, And so this is Linux. If I bring up the terminal window and I type Firefox, there it is. All right, it's just a command like ls, right? It just happens to have pretty pictures with it, whereas ls doesn't. That's the only difference. It's just a command that you type and run. In the, uh, in the Macintosh world, um, it's a little bit you can do that certainly if you have such a thing on your computer and now you'd have LS and so forth on the Mac but what I'm doing is the the thing that's Macintosh centric is the open keyword so this is not something that's Linux or Unix this is borrowed off of the um, uh, way back in the late 90s um, Steve Jobs had a company next and it had kind of a Unixy type operating system this comes from way way back and what you can do is in the Applications folder, I want to open up Sketchbook Express. And you can open up actual folders, right? So I can open up the Applications folder. Again, the, it's all Unix under the hood. So when I do that, there's my Applications folder. Okay. What if you want to bring up your current folder where you are right now? What, how do you represent the current directory? Open dot. There it is. All right. Uh, again, that's quirky to the Mac. So that's all I'm doing. Mm -hmm. No. If I do it, if I do it in Unix, it's gonna complain. 
let's see if I do it here. Dot, yeah, it bashes. It dot means something different, so that's what it's complaining about. <coughs> All right, uh, what else? Give me, give me something miscellaneous to talk about. Yeah. Um, what, oh, yeah. In a couple classes you showed us how to um, take all the instances of a word and edit them. Uh, the searching. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, it had been mentioned search and replace. Let me do that real quick. Uh, to search is just a slash, and what I want to search for, and that'll find all instances of that. And I can type n for next. So again, I'll go ahead into here and add that quickly. This is search for FDSA and go to the next found result. So here I can go slash A and now it highlights all those and I can type N, N, N to go to the next one and it'll loop around. Uh, for searching and replacing, it's it's a colon command. So you type a colon. You tell uh, where in the file you want to do the search and replace. So if I wanted to, I could do something like from line 5 to 12. I want to do my searching and replacing there. Usually people want to do the search and replace in the entire file. So you say from the first line to, and then the dollar sign is the generic for the end of the file at these colon commands. Uh, another alternative is percent means the entire file. I, for whatever reason, I learned it this way. S means search, new. That I'm, I'm not going to explain the details of it and the variance, but that's the recipe. So from the first line to the last line, I want to search for old and replace it with new, and I want to do that globally on each line. So the slashes separate these different uh, parameters. And I don't have old anywhere in here, so it doesn't do anything. But I can do something like search for the letter A and replace it with X, Y, Z. And I'll do that globally. How do you do if what you're searching for contains the slash? <laughs> if, you're, if something you're searching for contains the slash, so uh, like these two slashes, uh, I want to do search for, uh, you have to do a backslash. All right, so I'm looking for tons, and I want to replace slash tons, and I want to replace it with slash ounces. Unfortunately, that slash is the separator for my different arguments here. So that it doesn't get confused, I have to put a backslash. So that means I'm looking for the slash character. I'm looking for the slash character, and that replaces tons to ounces. Yeah. The secret word is, I didn't even prepare that, so I'm going to say the secret word is Yeah. Not remunerate, remunerate. All right, we'll uh, pick it up full speed ahead on Friday.